The goal of this video is to learn the basics of using vectors to describe the motion of points in the plane. This involves using vectors for position functions and then taking the derivative of such a function to get the velocity function and taking the norm of that velocity function to get a speed function. So first, there's a very easy idea of using vectors to represent points in the plane. And the idea is, if you have a point in mind, then you can use a vector by taking the tail and setting it at the origin so that the tip lands on the point in question. When you use a vector this way, often you'll, you'll modify a vector with position. So a position vector is meant to indicate a points in the plane by, by putting the tails at the origin. You've studied parametric curves before, which a, a parametric curve is simply a pair of functions that give you x and y coordinates at various times. If you were to plot such a curve, you would think of a particle moving through the plane from, in this case, time t equals a to t equals b. Well, if you allow a vector function to do the same thing, you're going you're gonna to get exactly the same picture, practically. So we'll assemble the x and y functions into a single vector function of t. We might call it s, which seems to be a traditional choice often. And s of t would be the position function, and you'd get exactly the same information, except you're describing points using vectors. Vector position functions or parametric curves, it's really the same thing. So one could ask quite fairly, why would you bother having two different ways of looking at it? And when you think of these, these gadgets as vector functions, then you can use all sorts of powerful tools, which we have yet to see in some cases, but you can use the dot product, you can take the vector derivative, which we're about to do. Very powerful tools that allow you to, to analyze your curve when you think of it as a vector function. Um, a parametric curve is more popular in software. Uh, it's, it's nice to be comfortable with this because it's often uh, consistent with the way you would put data into software to plot curves. So you really want to be able to go back and forth between these two ways of thinking about curves. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have s of t equals t squared minus 5 to t. t runs from 0 to 3. So let's get an animation of this. And we start at time 0. And you'll notice that when you plug 0 into your formula, you get negative 5, 0. So we already have the first position plotted with this vector, which starts at the origin. And we're going to have a little slider here, which will indicate where in time we are. And time will progress from 0 to 3. And we will trace out the path of the particle. And you'll notice it's sort of speeding up there, because those points are plotted at equal time intervals. Um, we'll see later another way of, of representing that graphically. Let's talk about derivatives of vector functions. Suppose we have a path traced out by a vector function and we have s of t and s of t plus h. So these are two different times separated by a quantity h. And this would be s of t plus h minus s of t, simply the vector difference. And the question is, what happens is the, in the limit as h approaches 0? so that we're taking two moments in time getting close together. Well, first of all, you'll notice that um, s of t plus h will start sneaking up on s of t. And this red vector, the difference vector, is getting smaller. And what, let's just brainstorm a little bit. What do we notice? Well, it looks like familiar to us. It looks like the secant construction when we took derivatives a little bit. And that leads us to a question, should we take a limit somehow? Is there a way to take a limit of this process? And is there a derivative lurking about? Let's look at this difference algebraically. We're going to apply this definition of s and simply plug in the functions x and y in components. And then we'll apply vector addition, really a subtraction, to get one single column vector. And in anticipation of the arrival of some sort of derivative, let's scale this vector by a factor of 1 over h. So all we've done here is multiplied all the vector quantities by 1 over h, scalar multiplication. So if the original uh, equations were valid, then so are these. And 
we're going to apply scalar multiplication so we can absorb the factor of 1 over h on the inside. And now we're sort of getting somewhere. 1 over h times this quantity on the left is equal to that quantity on the right. And let's use more suggestive notation for this quantity over here. If we were to instead write it as s of t plus h minus s of t over h, it would look an awful lot like a derivative. Now, we haven't seen what it means to, to take the quotient of a vector function by a scalar, but it's pretty obvious what it should mean. Just take that scalar, reciprocate it, and multiply scalar multiplication. So that's just a different way of writing what we had before. And what's nice about this is quite suggestive. That looks an awful lot like the formula for a secant slope. And we're really getting close to what we want to do. It's pretty obvious that we should be considering the limit of this as h goes to 0. But it's very important to keep things, these things straight. What does it mean to take the limit of a vector function, as we have on the right side? There's a pretty obvious way to define this. What we should do, perhaps, is to simply take the limit individually for each component and reassemble them into a vector function. So that's what we will mean when we take the limit of a vector function. And lo and behold, there are good old-fashioned derivatives of x and y. So this, once we uh, um, use this definition of limit, the gadget on the left side yields the vector function you get by putting x prime of t and y prime of t inside or if you like Leibniz notation, it would look like this. So we're ready for our definition. Given the vector function s of t with component functions x of t and y of t, the derivative with respect to t of this is defined to be this limit. And when that limit exists, the derivative can be calculated component-wise. So we simply take the derivative inside the column, so to speak, each function individually. We take the derivative, and depending on your favorite notation, it might look a little different. This is good news because it means that when we take the derivative of these uh, vector functions, we are really using old-fashioned technology. There's nothing new and exotic to do. We just do our usual thing with calculus on the inside. So if s of t was our example function from before, t squared minus 5 2t, then s prime of t would be 2t t. Now, all your usual rules apply, so here in the first component we've used the product rule, and in the second component we've used the, the chain rule. You have to be aware that you could, you could encounter different notations, and so you have to be flexible. So here are two versions of a third calculation using different notations, and you should be able to translate on the fly between various vector notations but the underlying mechanics of taking the derivative is exactly the same. If s is a position function, we define the velocity to simply be its derivative with respect to t. And we also define the speed function to be the magnitude of that vector function v. So we have velocity and speed. And the thing to remember is, by definition, the velocity is a vector, and the speed is a scalar. If you get these confused, that's natural. Speed, velocity sound like the same thing, but just remember that they have technical meanings. Velocity is the vector, speed is the magnitude of that vector, and therefore is a scalar quantity. In fact, it's got to be a non-negative scalar quantity. What does the velocity tell us? So we're going to look at this picture again where we take the difference s of t plus h minus s of t, and we're really going to let t go to zero here and this vector shrinks, but you'll notice that the direction in which it points seems to settle down. And in fact, as you take the limit of 1 over h times that quantity, you get a well-defined vector v of t, and we make the claim that v of t points in the direction of the tangent at that point. And one way to see this is you could look at the components of the vector v of t, namely dx dt and dy dt, and you can see that if you took those lengths you'd get the slope dy dx at the point as we've seen from parametric equations before. So v of t points along the tangent of the path at time t. Now you can take the norm, the magnitude of this vector, and you get a quantity. And what does that quantity tell you? And what we want to imagine is what if we were to turn off whatever forces 
I mean, we're not going to dig into the physics here, but some sort of force is constraining the particle to move along this curve. What if at the moment t pictured in this diagram, we were to somehow magically turn off all the forces? The claim is that whatever particle is moving along here would actually fly off on the tangent. And here's the key. The speed with which the particle would fly off the tangent would then be constant and would equal the norm of v of t at time t. So you might have a picture that looks something like this, where a particle is constrained to move along the curve, and then right at that time t, switch off the forces. Now it's simply moving along a straight line, and it'll be moving at a constant speed, and the speed is exactly that magnitude of v of t at time t. So we'll end by going back to our example, t squared minus 5, 2t. This time we will put in the velocity vector simultaneously in the animation. One thing to think of, it, v of t is 2t, 2. You could think of this as being a clip for t going from before 0, in which case we're sort of caught right in action as we start this movie. So it's already moving when t equals 0, and the velocity at t equals 0 is what you get when you plug 0 into v, you get 0, 2. So here's a the red vector here really is the velocity vector, and we've attached the tail right at the point where the, the position at time zero. And now we're just going to let the movie advance. And one of the things you'll notice is as, as the particle speeds up, the length of the vector v did increase. In other words, its speed was increasing. It was speeding up along that curve.